Today's event is a joint effort of the South Dakota No-Till Association, the Mitchell NRCS off Field Office, SDSU Extension, and the NRCS. And one of the first things I'd like to do is uh, thank all our sponsors that helped us put together and provide input and money uh, for today's event. And I'm going to just read through the list. Um, South Dakota Wheat Commission, Farm Credit Services of America, Wheat Growers, Mustang Seed, Monsanto, Prairie State Seeds, Next Level Ag LLC, Millborn Seeds, Lacrosse Seeds, Dakota Best Seed, Agronomy Plus, Farmers Alliance, Mitchell, First Dakota National Bank, C and B Operations in Davidson County Implement, Scott Supply, Crop Tech, Ducks Unlimited, Aurora County Conservation District, Davidson County Conservation District, Hanson County Conservation District, uh, South Dakota No-Till Association, SDSU Extension, USDA and NRCS, and Pioneer Hybrids of DuPont. So, Let's give them all a welcome round of applause. Our second speaker is Lance Gunderson of Ward Labs. Um, Lance started the Soil Health Division of Ward Labs in 2011, and he's going to talk about some of the new aspects soil health incorporates into soil tests. Lance. Okay, there we go. Good morning, everybody. Hear me all right? Okay. Well, I, I, I'm really glad to be up here today. Uh, unlike Jay, I had to come north for this trip. And uh, it's 70 degrees in, in Nebraska right now, where I'm from. And I kind of thought I'd see all the snow drifts and snow piles, but luckily it's been a little warm up here last week, so I see a lot of water. Uh, you guys kept all the snow. We didn't get anything this summer or this winter. I think we've had about an inch of snow in central Nebraska. So, uh, I've been at Ward Laboratories out of Kearney, Nebraska for about 16 years. I started there when I was a college student. Uh, so I've got a real good opportunity to learn a lot from Ray Ward. And uh, if any of you know Ray Ward, he always says he learned everything he knows from going back. So, uh, I'm in good company that way. I get an opportunity to learn from these guys. And uh, I'm going to come up here today and kind of talk to you about some of the different testing opportunities we're working on. Um, they are, and I say working on because they are a work in progress. Uh, we're still trying to develop these as we get feedback from producers and, and uh, universities and other growers. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about the Haney test. Uh, I, I used to kind of go through and talk about what the test was and, and what it isn't. I'm going to do that very briefly, but I want to focus more on results and, and what can you learn, what can you gain from it, how can we use it, and what should we not do with it. That's the other important thing, right? Um, it is a tool. It's a different tool in the, in the toolbox for you, but if you've, got, you've got to know how to use it properly and uh, avoid areas where you shouldn't be using it. So, by quick show of hands, how many of you have heard of the Haney test? That's, every time I ask that, I hear one more. How many of you have tried it? Okay, about a few. So I'll, I'm going to do try to do a little bit for, for both audiences. We'll go through a little bit about what it is and then how some of you can use it as you've already done. So I want to talk real briefly about what is the approach to Haney soil health testing. Traditional soil tests, uh, conventional soil tests, we focus a lot on soil chemistry. Right? Fertility, uh, how that relates to yield and crop production. But when we start getting into soil health, we talk a lot about the physical, biological, and chemical property. So we need a soil test that is going to start looking at some of those other aspects of soil. Now, I went out and run over here. I stole one of these. Jay said it was okay. I took one of these. Because this is something that is very difficult, and I'll say pretty much, I hate to use the word impossible, to measure in a laboratory. 
accurately. Okay? This is a field type test. Um, I'm so focused on the laboratory part. I've got I've got a huge farm in central Nebraska. I got 12 acres. One acre of that is a house, nine acres of that is trees, creek bottom. So I've got about two acres I get to play with. But I do. I put a 70 weight mix out this summer. Uh, native grasses, forbs, legumes. I don't have to worry about terminating. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen next year. So I get to play a lot more than the rest of it. But I'm interested to take that home. Now, I will say this. If somebody wants one of these and they run out, come find me. I'll give you this one. I'm not going to take that out of your pocket. If you want to take that home, do it. I'll steal one from somebody else some other time. <laughs> okay? So, on this Haney test, we're going to focus on a few different aspects. We're still going to look at soil NPK. I, I say soil NPK. We're going to expand on that. But we're still going to look at the chemical fertility of the soil. That is part of soil health. That's not going away. We're also going to start talking about these microbes. How can we start measuring microbial biomass? Can we get an indication of what these different practices are doing for that microbial community? Then we're going to talk about some of these other aspects of, of carbon and nitrogen. Uh, we often focus on soil organic matter or we talk about uh, nitrogen fertilizers. But we're going to look at these different pools and we're going to really talk about the balance between the carbon and the nitrogen and why that's important in a, in a healthy soil system. Finally, we come over and we start, we take these things and we try to address different aspects of soil health. Now, there's obviously things missing from this list. Bulk density, aggregate stability, porosity, water infiltration, all of those things. But we can, we can address some aspects using this test. And then we're going to try to provide you with some management recommendations. Notice I didn't say nutrient recommendations. That's part of it, but we want to look beyond the nutrient part and start talking about management implications on your farm. So I'm going to step through each one of these a little bit. Uh, Jay mentioned one of my favorite words, exudates. I heard that word probably 30 times yesterday, root exudates. So when we are growing a living plant, living roots, we think of roots taking things out of the soil. But it's really a two-way street. So the plant is taking up nutrients and moisture or water out of that soil. But at the same time, that plant is leaking different compounds back into that soil to feed the biology. And that does a couple of different things for the plant. Number one, it helps change the pH right around the root in that rhizosphere. So where that soil touches the root, that helps solubilize certain nutrients that the plant can then take up a little easier. Number two, those organic acids and those different compounds, amino acids and organic acids, they act as a readily available food source for microorganisms. So those bacteria can't get up and move around and the plant is helping supply it to the microbes because the microbes are going to help bring nutrients and things back in return. So the idea behind this test when we're analyzing for soil fertility is we're using an extract in the laboratory that is supposed to mimic that process. So Rick Haney simply calls it H3A. If you've heard of Malik or Olson, uh, nothing different there. He just named this extract. And he's using three of the most commonly produced organic acids in that extract. And we're, we're extracting the soil and we're analyzing right now for these nutrients. So you'll see nitrate, ammonium, phosphate, potassium. One of the things, you know, you'll notice right away that you're missing things like sulfur, maybe zinc, manganese. So these are things that we'll talk about a little later, but we're going we're to remedy that problem a little bit. We're also going to do uh, or measure what we call total extractable phosphorus. Because phosphorus in your soil, we understand, a lot of us know that when we, there's a lot of phosphorus out there that's not plant available. Uh, so we're going to start measuring that, that fraction as well. We want to know how much phosphorus is there. And finally, what are we looking at on the organic phosphorus? This is the, this is the stuff that's in solution in your soil. 
and the microbes can influence that and, and try to make some of that play available. We'll talk a little more about that. So, when you have a living root, don't pay attention to the bottom half of this stuff, but the, this living root, we get all these plant root exudates that come out into the soil. The microbes then can feed on that. These are the different classes of exudates, the organic acids, amino acids. But when the microbes feed on that, it starts all of these processes, all of these cycles down here that have to do with nutrient movement and nutrient cycling in your soil. And eventually, the plant is willing to give up some of that carbon into the soil so it can take up some of the nutrients that the microbes make available. It's a trading, trading system. Right? No such thing as a free lunch. So the plant is going to do this because it's going to get something in return. Now, we take that crop, and now the crop is, is not living. This is a non-living system. We get crop residues that go in, and, and we talked about decomposition. Well, part of this decomposition process, the microorganisms take oxygen, they decompose these residues, and here's another really great word that everyone likes to use. Humus, humic acid, that's kind of a buzzword. Humus is kind of the stable stuff that stays behind from decomposition. The other byproducts of decomposition for carbon are we generate CO2 and water, and then that CO2 can go back up to the next crop. The part of that cycle that happens in the soil takes place down here where we will build up humic acids and that's this immobilization part. So if you go up to, uh, well, we'll go up to the tundra, about 100 miles north of here, 200 miles north of here, there's not a whole lot of microbial activity taking place this time of year, right? That's part of this immobilization phase. That's where carbon and nutrients are, are staying in the soil because the microbes kind of slow down here. Decomposition slows down. All of this kind of comes to a little bit of a, of a halt. It doesn't stop completely, but it, it, it's sure hard to watch. Jay got bored after two hours of watching that water infiltrate. He'd stand out there for three weeks and not see a whole lot happen. But as this continues, the microbes produce proteins and polysaccharides those are the glues that we talked about, holding those soil particles together. So that's part of the aggregate formation, part of decomposition and, and the biology. This is the part, this mineralization part is the, is the part that producers really should pay a lot of attention to. Because feeding your biology, we talk about covers and we talk about manures and brazing and all of this information, but feeding all of those things, ultimately, you get a little return here out of the soil. You put good in, you get good out. And you start to get nutrients turning back over in that soil, and that's what you're really after when you get around to growing your next crop. So the point is, how do we, how do we kind of measure this? And how do we, how do we measure decomposition? Uh, well, a really easy way for you guys in the field is to watch. Don't stand there for four days, but when you come by, look at it. How fast is that residue turning over? I hear this all, I usually hear this one more often than the other. I've got corn stalks that I've seen in my field for three years. Okay? Very little, see I've got a residue problem, right? You don't have a residue problem, you have a soil biology problem. The buildup of residue is the symptom. But that's one way to gauge decomposition. You get to the other extreme, I've got a few people that call me and say, I can't keep residue on my field. Right? That's the other extreme of that problem. You still have a biology problem. They're eating everything more than you want them to. Jay talks about trying to keep the ground armored and covered. And you'll hear that over and over. And that's a goal. But once you build the system up, that goal gets to be a little more difficult than uh, the other one at times. So one of the ways we can kind of gauge how fast this is occurring is we can measure soil respiration. I mentioned here that when decomposition takes place, we give off carbon dioxide. 
So when we look at respiration taking place in the soil, that's one of the ways that we can kind of see how fast this is happening. So in the laboratory, there's, there's a laboratory technique and a field technique to this, and there's many others uh, dealing with respiration. In the, in the field, you are dealing with conditions that you're dealt at the time you go out and measure this. Right? I mentioned that if you went and tried this now, decomposition would be a lot slower because the soil temperatures are cooler. Now in a laboratory, we're going to correct for that. We're going to take all of the soils, we're going to dry them down to so they're equal moisture, and we're going to re-wet those soils, and we're going to incubate those at a constant temperature. And that temperature is supposed to be kind of the optimum temperature. So we talk about soils not wanting them to be too hot or too cold or too wet or too dry. That's what we're trying to get at. Those conditions typically happen on average about four times per year in a growing season. That's, that's just kind of the nationwide average on it. Um, but that's what we're mimicking in the laboratory, that drying rewetting process that happens. Uh, some years it never tends to dry out, and other years it never tends to uh, rain. So that does happen, and that affects mineralization. But this is kind of the average. Now, when a soil, so if I have a soil that produces twice as much CO2 in the same amount of time as another soil, which soil is hard, working hard? Which soil is more alive? The one that breathes hard, right? This is just measuring how hard your soil is breathing. Gas exchange goes in, oxygen, atmosphere goes into your soil. Microbes are like you and I. They eat, which we get to do, I think, shortly when I'm done, right? They eat, and when they eat carbon, what, what are you breathing out? Carbon dioxide. So microorganisms are doing the same thing in that soil. The more food we can provide them, and the more microbes there are, the more CO2 your soil can produce. When conditions are right. Now, if your soil is as dry as concrete, they're not doing much, or if it's frozen. But under those conditions, we get this, this generation of CO2. So when we set everything equal, we can look at two different soils, or two different management schemes, and we can look at the effect of grazing, and we can look at the effect of cover crops on microbial respiration. And the higher that number, on average, the more microbes you have in the soil, which leads to more activity, nutrient cycling, soil uh, structure building, aggregate stability, all of those things. So this is how we can look at some of these. It's also related to a soil's fertility and its textural class. Different soils have different potentials, right? So that, that's something we just keep in mind. Now there's a lot of text on here. What I'm going to show, what I'm showing you, and you got, I think you've got this in your handout, I believe, is that this is how we would kind of look at the solita or the, the soil respiration scores, and how we would kind of rank these when we get our results back. <laughs> Sorry, I noticed one of the, the, the pages are off color. <laughs> Coffee. <laughs> uh, so we look at these, these rankings, and I want to point out that you'll notice when you look at these, you know, we, got, we go from very low, low, little below average, little above average, high and very high. The first thing somebody usually points out to me is, well, there's no true average. Correct. There is no true average. Is a soil that scores a 40 from New Mexico technically the same as a soil that scores 40 from Central Iowa? No. That soil in New Mexico, I might say, with low organic matter, if it's respiring 40, I'm going to say that's probably getting above average for that area. But if I was in Central Iowa, I'm not picking on anybody from Iowa if you're here, but if I was in Central Iowa, I'd say that's probably on the low side. Okay? You've got to take some of that into account. It's really difficult to give a, a range for 
nationwide things. And, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to break this down a little more and make it regionally specific. But right now we don't have enough data. But what this means for, you know, so okay, well, so I got my score. What does this mean? How do I, okay, great, it's low, or great, it's high. What do I do? Well, typically soils that are very low, these are the, the characteristics they have. Little potential for activity, very slow uh, decomposition or nutrient cycling. If you're planting high carbon uh, crops, corn, wheat, milo, or high carbon cover crops, your residue might stick around for three years. And you also have usually a tie up of nitrogen in that system because the microbes have a lot of carbon to eat but they have very little nitrogen to use to break down that carbon. And they need the nitrogen to break down the carbon. Now if you take the other extreme and you say, okay, well I've got scores consistently above 100, I've got very high, your nutrient cycling and your residue decomposition are taking place very quickly. So from a management perspective, this will kind of influence you or could guide you a little bit on well, what am I going to put out there for, you know, if I'm interested in covers, what am I going to go with? You know, we see, if you Google cover crops and you get online and you see guys standing in their cover crop fields that are this tall, right, and they're, you know, or they're holding radishes, I love Dave Brand's picture, that radish is like six feet long. Is that really what you want if you've got really low respiration? Probably not. Matter of fact, I'll just say no. Because you're going to be really, really upset with whoever got you convinced to go plant a cover crop. If you've got a really small fire, think of this as fire, and you go dump a truckload of logs on it that are all this big around and that long, you smother your fire. Okay? So we want to start small. We want to start with stuff that has a low seed in ratio. We want to start with cover crops that will break down quicker. Now, if you have cattle as a tool or livestock, you can get away with growing something this tall because then you change how long you're going to graze it and when. And then you talk to somebody smarter than I am and figure out when you, you know, how to make that work. I don't run a lot of cows in my 12 acres. <laughs> <laughs> I've got an Alaska Malamute and uh, about 15 coyotes and a wild cat or two, but they don't like to graze much. So, you, you know, but you see what I'm saying with this, this is how we can use some of this information. If you come back and say, well, I've got a really big fire. That question of grazing before, how much do you take, how much do you leave? Well, leave half. If you're, if you're in a really bad situation where you've got a really small fire, you might graze it down to, you know, you might take two thirds and see if that residue still disappears because you don't want to bury yourself either. So this is how we kind of use respiration. Any questions on that? I'll take questions in the middle. No? Okay. The third part of the Haney test is a water extract. So I mentioned that we evaluate plant nutrients on what's called an H3A extract. The other part of the, of the test is we do a water extract. I need a little water right now. Now I ask, you know, people ask me why water? You know, what I mean, they think of a lab and we, you know, we're playing with chemistry and chemicals and all this stuff, and why water? And I asked Rick Haney, I said, why water? And he said, well, believe it or not, it actually rains water. <laughs> I couldn't argue with that logic. So he's using water as an extract because he wants to know what the microbes are exposed to and what they see in that soil environment. Now, obviously, when that water gets into your soil, there's other things that get mixed in with it. But part of that is what we're measuring, the stuff that, get, that gets mixed in with that water. So here in a little bit, we're going to have lunch. And unless, uh, unless Ruth really set it up beautifully for us, I imagine we're gonna to have to get up and walk out there and get a plate of food. I tell you, it's tough, tough work. Microbes don't have that ability, right? Bacteria don't have legs, they don't have arms. 
And, and I'll take you down memory lane. Think back again, that high school biology class that we were talking about earlier. I know you didn't pay attention to the Sobata thing because that I went through that 10 or 12 times. That's, that's tough. But you remember when you took pond water and put it on a microscope slide and you're looking through there and you see stuff dart around and swim all over? That's what we have locked in our head up here that's going on. We think microorganisms are just swimming all over the place. They do not do that in soil. Bacteria and fungi live in, in colonies and groups and they're here to soil particles and around organic matter. They don't just move around. So they need a food delivery system, a really good one. They, don't, they can't move around, so water is that food delivery system. So when it rains, we wash residues, we wash carbon into the soil. As that passes by those colonies of bacteria and microbes, they can take, they grab onto that and use it. When it moves laterally in the soil, same thing occurs. Or how about when your soil starts to dry out and the water starts moving back up? Same thing occurs. So this is why we're looking at the water extract because we want to get an idea of what's in that water, what's in the soil that can be in the water that the microbes can utilize. And what we're going to measure is we're going to measure organic carbon. Now we talk a lot about carbon and I want you to keep in mind this is how much carbon we can extract with water. It's not the same thing as organic matter. I'll mention that in a minute. We're also going to measure extractable total nitrogen. So we normally focus on things like nitrate when we talk about soil fertility, and that's what we measure in a lab. But a microorganism would rather eat protein than take it in a pill. Right? So we're going we're gonna to measure nitrate and ammonium, but we're going to subtract that from the total nitrogen, and that gives us this fraction of organic in, soluble organic in. Then this is the balance we're looking at. We're going to look at how much seed in and what the balance is of that food for the microbes, and we're going to talk about mineralizable in and organic in release, and finally Rick gives you what he calls the soil hustle. So I, I promised you I'd give you a quick mention of soil organic matter versus water extractable. The best way I can describe this is that soil organic matter is the quantity of carbon and it represents the house. So the higher that percent soil organic matter, the bigger the house. The bigger the house, the more microbes you can have, you can hold, right? Water extractable organic carbon represents the amount of food in that house. Okay, they're related, but I've seen soils with one and a half percent organic matter have really high water soluble carbon numbers. Because those soils typically have a large input, if you're trying to fix them, they've got a large input of manures, maybe compost, compost teas. Those are all sources of organic in, and they're growing covers if they can. And I've seen soils as high as six and a half percent soil organic matter that basically have less than a hundred parts per million soluble carbon. Great big house, no food. So a follow-up question: How many of you have kids? <laughs> Nobody wants to admit it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've got one, she's eight months old, and if she keeps growing, I don't know how I'm gonna feed her because she, she's from daddy's stock, right? <laughs> what happens if you have a bunch of teenagers in the house and you don't have any food in it? <laughs> Doesn't work real well, right? Yeah, they leave. I heard that, they do. The microbes will starve, okay? Microbes are teenagers. Another way I describe them is the mafia. <laughs> they take their cut. Okay? The point is, is that if you don't keep the refrigerator stocked, if you're not constantly, this goes back to what Jay was talking about, if you're not constantly putting carbon into the system, the microbes will burn the house down. And they have to to survive. And you can relate that to, to cattle grazing. How many of you have seen the movie Jurassic Park? Anybody have a fence around their pasture that looks like the one they had for T-Rex? If you built one, 
and you put your cows out there and never move them, they eat everything. Eventually, they would eat it. They try. Because they have two choices eat it or starve. If you are feeding hay, or if you're doing that type of system, when it gets cold out, you dump a semi-load of hay bales into the bunk and just say, all right, see you in five months. No, it's a constant input, right? Soils are the same way. You gotta have more of a constant input. When we grow annual crops with nothing behind it or in front of it, we end up with well, what do you, you guys got a two-week growing season in North Dakota? You get about four <laughs> weeks down here? So you get, what, you get, you get what, three months, four months, five months of growing season? And that's your input. That's your carbon input. And then we take a whole bunch of that carbon and we haul it to the elevator and say good luck. So my point is, is that if we put low energy in here, this is the energy, the soluble stuff, and we're feeding this, they start burning the house down. We see organic matter numbers drop. They keep, they've been dropping. So keep that in mind. The other part of this is that we have water-soluble nitrogen. The organic nitrogen is tied with the carbon. They're not independent. They come together in a package. So I'm going to go back to the kids. Why did, why did I'll say mom, I'll say, why did mom say, because dad doesn't care. But why, why did mom say, you can't give the four-year-old a can of Coke and a pixie stick for lunch? <laughs> it's all carbon, right? Real high energy. And they run around the house, you know, for 30 minutes, I mean, in circles, and then they slam into a wall, and they sleep for four hours. <laughs> it's real high carbon, no nutrition, okay? So let's take the other extreme. Why can't you just feed them a bunch of multivitamins? No energy. No energy. You need both. The doctor keeps saying you gotta eat a balanced diet, right? I'm probably a little too high on the energy side. <laughs> That's okay. Don't tell the doctor. <laughs> your soils, most of your soils are really high on the nutrient side, they're really low on the energy side. Carbon is where we struggle the most. But if they are tied together, and, when, and if you think to feeding your cattle again, why do you care about what you're feeding them? Wheat straw versus alfalfa bales. Different feed values, right? Different gains, different energies, different, I mean, so what we put into the soil has an effect on what the microbes are able to do for us. So we start looking at this soluble organic nitrogen. This is the pool of nitrogen that's available to your microbes. And you'll notice when I list these sources up here, ammonium nitrate, UAN, ammonium sulfate, those are not direct sources of organic in. It's these things. You do get some out of your soil organic matter. Cover crops, your other crop residues, plant residues, manure, compost, compost teas, animal residues. I got an email this morning where a gentleman had a uh, two-year-old buck laid out in his cover crop field and died this spring. And he said, he said, I got a micro crop. <laughs> he sent me the picture and there's nothing left but little tiny four corns and a couple of ribs. All of those things are actually sources. Now, I'm not telling you to go shoot a bunch of deer and spread it on your field. You don't like that. But all of those are sources of, of protein and nitrogen. So that's what we're looking at. So here's some ranges. If you run the Haney test, this is what we're seeing. Overall range for carbon, usually somewhere between 50 and 1,000 parts per million. Nitrogen, somewhere between 5 and 100. Typically, though, on average, I've got most soils are falling, especially row crop situations, are falling between 1 and 300 and 10 and 30 for carbon and nitrogen, respectively. Perennial systems uh, tend to score higher than, than row crop systems. Why? I mentioned you only have a four week growing season up here. Annuals don't have a lot of opportunity to put carbon back into that soil. So that's why we typically see that. In general, the higher these numbers are, the better, with one big caveat. 
They got to be balanced. We can't have real high energy and low nutrition, or vice versa. We got to have, got to have a balance. I want to mention that this fluctuates throughout the year, naturally, right? And that makes sense. And the further north you go, the more, well, I shouldn't say the more it fluctuates, but the higher the peaks and lower the valleys, because it's much more intense for a shorter amount of time. And we know that. I've been able to actually track that now. So we kind of have an idea of how this will move throughout the year. But that, that has implications for sampling. you got to keep that in mind when you, if you decide to do some of these, when you're going to sample and try to be consistent. Okay, so this is that seed in balance we talked about. On the test, we mentioned that when we see a seed in ratio above 20 to 1, we will give you no credit for, for mineralization for nitrogen. Okay? Nitrogen is limiting in that system for bacteria. Now this is not, this 20 to 1 seeding ratio is not the same as the seeding ratio of your cover crop mix. It's not the same as the seeding ratio on your organic matter. This is somewhere in between there. This is what the microbes are actually eating on. But bacteria have a seeding ratio. Anyone want to take a guess? Corn to 80 to 1, usually at maturity. Bacteria have a seed in ratio of about 3 to 1. That should be like, oh, that, that should be revelation, though. <laughs> Everyone just look at it. What that means is, is that bacteria, bacteria really crave nitrogen. For every three carbons that they need, they need one nitrogen. Okay? Soybeans are, what, 30 to 1 in that range? So what I'm saying is, is that if the, if the nitrogen is limiting in that system, in their food, the organic end, they tie up nitrogen, they keep it from the plant. So that can be detrimental. Ideally, we like to see this to get between 8 and 15. That's where we, we'd like to get it. And crop rotation, uh, crop rotation plays a role in it, so do just inherent soil properties. Um, some soils have, tend to have a higher seeding ratio than others. But 30 years of continuous corn, like I've been sampling uh, in northern Nebraska on some of the sandhill stuff, have seeding ratios in the 40s and 50s. <laughs> I got Jane's attention. Yeah. Continuous corn for 30 years, and that's what, you know, now that doesn't happen all over because, I mean, I've, I've done continuous corn out of Iowa, and their seed-in ratios are 18 to 20. But they had more nitrogen in the bank to start with. That organic matter is higher in those soils than the sand hills and the grass. So um, we can influence that with management. Now, when we get that number down into those ranges, we start to turn nutrients over, and we start to kick nitrogen back out to the next crop. So again, a lot of text here. I'm going to leave this with Ruth. I think this is also in the handout. So those are your, your management implications when you're looking at these. So if you look at your seed in ratios above 20, pretty easy. You got too much carbon or not enough organic nitrogen. So what do I do? I increase legumes in my rotation if I, uh, or in my cover mixes. I reduce my high carbon inputs. And sometimes, uh, say inputs, that's even your crop. You know, instead of going corn, corn, wheat, beans, or something, try to stick something else in there. Uh, if you're grazing, graze longer. So try to let the cattle help you reduce that carbon that's going on the surface. Now, you don't want to graze it bare. I mean, you've got to leave some out there, but you can graze it a little longer and, and take a little more off. Same thing on the poor side. You've got little, little energy, so you're going to look at doing the opposite. Increase high carbon inputs. Graze a little short. There's other things you can put on this list. You be a little creative with it. Once you get into these ranges here, 8 to 15 is good. 10 to 12 is absolutely ideal. The, 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 once you balance that ratio, the goal is to drive up those numbers together. Intensity becomes the name of the game. Increase the amount of carbon inputs going into your system. Increase that cycling and then keep that, drive that system up together. So now, 
We take all that information and we compile it together and Rick gives you a score. Everybody wants a score or a number. So what's the next question, right? What's a number mean? <laughs> Nothing. That you like hearing that. The number itself doesn't mean anything unless you put it in context. If I were to sit here, if I were to sit up here and say 74, 29, what does that mean? Nothing. I gotta, I gotta know what, what a context is. So Rick Haney says we like to see the score above seven. And I always tell people this because I hate getting yelled at for it. I asked him why seven. And he shrugged his shoulders and said, why not? <laughs> It is just a starting point. But go back to our example, New Mexico and Iowa. How, anybody here from Iowa? Oh, wow, just one? Okay, somebody hold on to him. <laughs> <laughs> Two? Okay, he's by the back door. I might have a good running start. Um, so here, here's the example I'm going to give you. So somebody called me up. They were actually from New Mexico. This is why I give this example. I found out in New Mexico they farm just like we do. He had an organic pecan farm. Everybody's doing that, right? But the trick was is that he was growing covers in his orchard, and he was grazing them with sheep. And he'd been doing it for about 12 years. And he ran one of these tests, and he heard Rick Haney say, you need to score something above seven. He scored a 6.96, real close. And he was depressed, and he called me up, and he said, well, I don't think this is working. And then, you know, I, mean, I thought it was, but now the numbers tell me they're not working. I said, go find me what you think is the worst soil you can find, by your own definition. And he said, that's easy. That's my neighbor's one. <laughs> well, don't tell him that. I said, what's he doing? And he says, well, he's an organic pecan farm, too. Except he uses three or four tillage passes, or passes between his trees. And he's doing nothing else. He tries to keep everything as clean as a tabletop. High inputs. That's okay. We ran it. Scored a 1.2. Still to this day, the lowest soil I've ever tested. It looked like crushed up concrete. Now, I said, okay, well then go find me what you think is the best soil you can find. If you can find soil. He went out and he went about a mile down the road and he found a native area that's never been managed and he pulled a sample and it's already 7.3. Is it realistic for him to think he's going to score a 20? No. But that gave us context. Now that number meant something and his attitude changed overnight. That he was doing a good job, he was doing the right thing. He was seeing progress. Now, the reason why I pick on Iowa is because I've done this in Central Iowa. We ran, I think, a lot of samples out of Central Iowa. And when I put this slide up there, you should have seen it. Everybody's high-fiving each other because we're doing real good, you know. And I don't pick on them too much, but they were blessed with some pretty good soil to start with. And their average score, their lowest score, was almost an 8.3 that they had in that producer group. The absolute worst soil I could find would was been in uh, continuous corn for 36 years. Um, I don't care what it yields because yield is not a measure of soil health in my opinion. Uh, been tilled, uh, average two passes per year for over 60 years. Scored a 7.7. But when I found that best soil I could find in Central Iowa, it scored a 29. So suddenly, eight and a half isn't looking too good anymore, okay? But I tell you that story because so many people are, are interested in what this number is and what it means, but you gotta put it into context. And you can do that on your own farm really easy. You go find a soil that you think is really poor and one that you think is really great. Try to look beyond yield, and you don't need to spend a lot of money doing it. You don't need to run 100 samples, you run two. And once you've kind of established that range, it gives you an idea of where you're at. And now you can track that change over time within your farm. Okay? So that's how we kind of use this. So what am I going to do first? 
If I did this, I'm going to balance the seed in ratio first. That's my goal. Um, I usually tell people this. The way I think of that is that I've got a friend of mine who's a real car. He's a, he's a mechanic. He's a car guy. He came to me one day and he says, man, you should see. I got this, I got this Corvette I bought the other day. You should see how fast this thing goes. I said, no kid. He goes to start it and won't start. I said, yeah, it goes zero. <laughs> That's great. I don't care how fast you think it goes or how high the speedometer says. If you don't get the engine started, you'll never find out. Balancing the seat in ratio is what helps get the engine started. Once you get it started, then you can fine tune the system. But until you get that process going, you know, Jay talked a lot about the transition. You know, you do things a little differently in those transition years than you do in year seven and eight and nine. Because your soils build up resilience, they become more resilient to drought, compaction, disturbance. So it's during those transition years you're going to work on balance of that ratio. So I mentioned this, start with the soil health score. The soil health score immediately, if I've got two samples under different management, I look at one and it's 15 and I look at the other and it's 8, that tells me something right away. Without digging into it anymore, it tells me something. Now if I use that equation that you all have in that handout, I believe, you can actually go through and determine, okay, where am I doing well and where do I need a little help? I'm balanced on my ratio or I'm not, or well, my carbon's pretty low, I should increase that. And if you do those things, your respiration should go up because if you provide microbes more food and a better habitat, they'll reproduce and they're more active. And I mentioned this, talk about establishing ranges on your own farm. Again, it's, or, or with neighbors, you know, if you've got neighbors that are interested, I wouldn't advise hopping the fence to your neighbor because you think he's got the worst soil. That's a pretty risky, but work with them. Work with them, see what you can do. The last, last couple slides here is when and how do I use it? There's two major ways you can use the Haney test. One of them is just tracking different soil health indicators. That's probably the most popular way of using the test right now, and that's probably what I would recommend. You can sample this any time of year. If you want to get out a snow shovel and scoop 60 inches of snow out of the way, or have Jay do it, he's a professional, and get out a drill, and drill a hole, go for it. You can do it any time of the year, but that means that you got to do it at about the same time every year. When you're tracking this change over time, you've got to be consistent. We don't want to compare samples in June to uh, January to June. Right? How often do I want to do it? I put up here once per year or every other year. I would even tell you every three years, depending on what you're doing. I tell guys in central Nebraska, they, you know, well, I'm really excited about soil health and I'm going to try to do some different stuff. Okay, what are you doing? I'm going to go no to that it? Yep. I'm going to go to Okay. That's fine. That's a great place to start. But there's no reason to run this test every single year if you're just going to stick with your corn bean rotation and go no to with all the high inputs. Because this test won't tell you anything that you, you're not going to learn anything. So I'd, I'd be looking at at least three years. Now, if you get really excited and you leave here and you say, you know what, I'm going all in. I'm doing the whole whole wax, I'm doing all in. We're going to get livestock integration, I'm doing different cover mixes, I'm changing my whole rotation, I'm parking all the equipment, we're going to do all this stuff. Test once a year. Once a year. Because you're going to start seeing changes occur much quicker that way in that type of system. You don't want to waste your time and money with it. The other way, and boy, keep in mind that during those transition years, there's bumps in the road, not just watching them in your field, we'll see that on the test. A lot of times the first year using cover crops, these numbers go down. And it makes sense. Because now your soil is trying to support more plants than it's had to support in 100 years. So some of these numbers go down, it, it's kind of a shock. You take that one step forward, two steps back approach the first year. And eventually you're taking 
two steps forward, one step back, and then after three to five years, depending on what you're doing, you just kind of see more of a steady trend out. But we do see that on here. The other way of, of using the test is for nutrient management. Now, I say nutrient management, right now it's really nitrogen management. Uh, we're still working on this. I actually just got back from Rick Haney's place a week ago. It was 88 degrees or something like that in Temple, Texas. So it's coming. I think they're, I think they're playing corn next week. Uh, it's pretty bad now. But nutrient management. We talked about, you know, it, it makes sense prior to your fertilizer application when you're trying to reduce some input cost. And then if you're using that, you got to sample every year. But I want to talk just briefly a little more about nutrient management. So I'm going to focus on nitrogen right here on this slide. Excuse me. On a conventional soil test, most soil tests from any lab, you are going to get nitrate as a credit. So when you call and say, how much nitrogen is in my soil, generally we measure nitrate and we give you a number. Excuse me. And the Haney test, now that, that, I'm going to say this, Dwayne, don't throw anything at me. That works to a point. And what system you're in, it, it, it works. But as we get away from, as we try to, you know, get on board and get everybody together and move away from those, you know, conventional paradigms of, well, I'm going to grow this crop, and this is what it needs, and I'm going to put on this much because I already have this much myself. We try to get away from some of that. We can't just measure nitrate. We probably can't just measure these three things either, but this is where we're going to start. On the Haney test evaluation, we're going to look at that same nitrate, but we're also going to measure ammonium, and then we're going to calculate or estimate, it is an educated estimate, how much of this organic nitrogen pool is going to become available to you in that growing season? That's the magic question, right? How much nitrogen can I get out of this? Well, the way we're going to do that is we're going to look at three things. We've already talked about it. Seed in balance. If your seed in ratio is really high, the answer is zero. That's the credit we're going to give you. None. So that's the first thing we look at. Now, if the ratio is balanced, the second thing we're going to look at then is how much organic nitrogen do I have in that water extract from the test? If you've got 10 pounds of organic nitrogen in that water extract, guess what your maximum credit is? 10 pounds. We will not give you a credit any higher than that because we couldn't measure anything higher than that. The third thing we looked at is microbial biomass. That's solvita, respiration. I told you before that if you have really low microbes, really small fire, what's your potential for decomposition? <coughs> really low. You have a really low potential for decomposition and nutrient cycling, we can't very well give you a high credit for nitrogen out of that. So those three things get factored in to this estimate of mineralization. So what happened in 2012? Nobody likes to talk about 2012. I had a guy call me from Kansas and he said, there is no way I got that much mineralization this year. It's too dry. And I said, so? Did you grow a crop? Well, no, I didn't have any water. Well, then what difference does it make? You understand what I'm saying? Is it, we're, we are estimating this, and when conditions are really bad and you don't have water, yes, we are probably going to overestimate. But if you're in a dry land situation, water is probably going to be your limiting factor, not nitrogen, in most situations. On the other end, we get a really great year, weather year, and we're probably underestimating a little bit on how much of that's going to become available. Because if you're getting good times and rains and your temperatures are, are uh, not too extreme soil temperatures, we can get some pretty big numbers out of this. So on your report, what we're showing you, this is actually off of the soil report at Ward. We show you what a traditional evaluation would be, that's nitrate only. 
We'll show you what the hand test evaluation is and then what the pounds of indifference is. That difference sometimes is minuscule. It's five pounds to the acre. The guys across from the lab in Kearney, they, I think they do about six tillage passes a year, still life in anhydrous, um, corn, corn, bean rotation. And I'd run one of their soils just to see it, and the pound difference was about 2.3. Doesn't do you any good. So this test, I would tell them, don't even run it. It's not going to help you. It, you know, it just tells you what we already know. Now, on the other extreme, uh, Who's, 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 uh, who's South Dakota soil producer of the year? Who's a big name in South? I always throw out Gabe Brown, but I, I don't want to do that because I'm here. I don't want anybody to know boo or his. All right, nobody's going to volunteer. Okay, Gabe Brown, we run some of his soils. The pound, of, the difference that we see on his is about 100, well, he's about 80 parts per million, so about 150 pounds of difference. His, nitri his nitrate numbers are typically below four pounds to the acre credit. So if we were giving him a nitrogen recommendation for 150 bushel corn, we'd tell him he needs to put on 150 units in because he has no nitrogen in his soil. But then he turns around and grows a big corn crop with no nitrogen application and it's coming from somewhere. A traditional test doesn't show us any of that. The Haney test tries to show us some of that. Now it doesn't always work. And I certainly wouldn't tell you to go out and reduce your nitrogen application 150 pounds just because the test said so. Gabe's a little different monster, right? He's pretty confident in what he's doing, and he takes that as a challenge. So he's going to try it out. Point is, is that this is what we're trying to do, and as the, as the soil gets healthier, that credit gets larger. Because most of our soils, if we're in a conventional system and they're not very healthy, what we have is an inorganic nitrogen pool, organic nitrogen pool. But as we get healthier, this starts to flip flop. Okay? That's what we end up seeing. So you build up the organic pool and keep the inorganic stuff down. Who fertilized the prairie? Buffalo. Biology did it for us, right? distributed nutrients. Now, the one big difference is that in an agriculture system, we're exporting more so than a prairie. But my point is, if you measure in prairie soil, the level of available nutrients is pretty low. They always tell you, what's some of the worst soils on the planet? Rainforest. Go down to Amazon. Look at the soils down there. How productive is that soil? Look at all the stuff that's growing. All the nutrients are tied up in that biomass. Agriculture systems don't work that way. We want it all tied up in the biomass for a short amount of time, and then the rest of the time, we just want it to sit there in the soil and wait. And that's what we've got to get away from. Keep it tied up in the system and let the system be more productive. But that's part of this here. Uh, last thing, so we try to generate modern, what we call modern day recommendations. So, one of the things we need to consider if you're using the Haney test for, for nitrogen management, you've got to start looking at subsoil nitrogen. In most dry land situations, especially in this part of the country, subsoil nitrate, don't run a Haney test on your subsoil. It is a waste of money. Unless you're really interested. But save your time, run it on the topsoil, run the cheap $5 test on the subsoil. We are going to start including all the other, well, I should say all, most of the other plant nutrients. I mentioned before that right now you don't get sulfur and zinc and manganese and those things. We're going to start adding those in. We're just going to toss them on the report for you. And Ray Ward, who is much smarter than I, is going to be, we've been working on this together, we're going to start providing fertility recommendations for all of those plant nutrients, if you give us a crop and a yield goal, and we're not just going to be looking at NPK, we're going to use the H3 values from the test. And the way we're doing that, real quickly, not to get into it in too much detail, how many of you, have you heard of Bailey 3 phosphorus? Have you heard of Olson phosphorus? Bray B1 phosphorus? Seen those? Heard of them a little bit? All three of those tests are analyzing the exact same thing. 
but they're just using different chemistries to do it. So you get three different numbers. Well, in this case, we're using the same exact techniques to measure potassium and calcium and iron and all those things, but we're using a different extract. So we get a different number. What we've been doing for the last three to four years is we've been compiling a database of samples where we run all of these nutrients and we also run a traditional test and we're running on the same sample so we can start to kind of correlate how these are related to each other. For example, potassium on the Haney test will be two to three times lower than it will be on a conventional test using ammonium acetate. We've got around 14,000 samples and say that's true from all over the country. So now that we have an idea of how that works, we can start using the, the current recommendation equations and using these numbers in those equations, we just adjust that before we put it in there. Does that make sense at all? So we're going to start offering this. Um, we're also going to be changing the factors. How many of you, has anybody ever figured out how much nitrogen you need to grow a bushel of corn? If you ask 10 different people, you'll get 10 different numbers, usually. I mean, you know, universities tell you different things and labs tell you different things. We ran into a great example of this um, with some data that, I don't know if I should even say, that Dwayne sent us here recently on some Milo stuff. One of the big problems is that Rick Haney's using a different value for nitrogen on, on crops than South Dakota State or Ray Ward. So we're going to eliminate that problem too. We're going to, we're going to make those the same and hopefully that will help uh, make recommendations a little better. Uh, beyond the fertility recommendations, this test allows us to make some recommendations to you about management. Cover crop mixes, I'm not going to tell you what species to plant, but I can give you kind of a ratio of grasses and legumes, brassicas to kind of get you started based on some of these results. If you got a big fire, a little fire, is your seeding ratio out of whack? So that's what we're working on. I think I got maybe just two minutes for questions. If anybody had any, yeah. Uh, specifically on the Haney test, what type of variation are we going to see between the different laboratories? That's a great question. So the question, yeah, the question was on the Haney test specifically, what kind of variation will you start to see between different laboratories? A lot. I I wish I could tell you better. No. And, Unfortunately, here's what happens. Rick Haney takes his test, and he will let anybody who asks him run. Then those laboratories run home, and they say, well, we can't run it the exact same way that lab's running it. We need a competitive edge. We're going to change this. And they change something on it. And every lab starts doing that, and pretty soon, you got nothing. And that's incredibly frustrating for even a guy in a lab because it takes validity away from the test. Now, I can tell you that what we're doing is what Rick is doing. I, that's why we call it the Haney test. We haven't changed the name of it. I'm stamping his name on it. We're doing it the way he's doing it. Now, I went down to Temple and talked to him about adding in these other nutrients, and he gave us that okay. He said he was doing that work five years ago. He just never included it. There's a couple other labs that are doing a really good job, um, as far as I know, and then there's there's a few that aren't. But, yeah. So one of your recommendations for we got a high carbon and nitrogen ratio in the soil. Yeah. One of your recommendations is to reduce the high carbon input. Yep. Wouldn't it be a lot better to add more again so you can grow your egg better faster? Yeah. So. And the question was, if you have a high seeded ratio, one of the recommendations is to lower the carbon inputs. And he asked, would it be better to just increase the amount of N uh, to keep that carbon and build a solar organic factor? It depends how you're going to add in, would be my answer. Uh, if you just say, well, I'm going to add nitrogen, so I'm going to go buy a bunch of UAN, that's not a really good way of adding nitrogen to the system, in my opinion. Now, if you're going to put that, if you're going to put that out there with covers to tie that up right away and get it incorporated into the system, then yes, I think that'll work to do that. 
The reason why I don't tell people to just add more in is because that's the first thing a lot of individuals think of, and then they want to just go buy more, put on more nitrogen. Uh, but really, it's the form of it. We want it in the organic form. So as long as you're going to get it tied up right away and convert it through the system, then it'll work. You want to get tied up right away with that high ratio? Not necessarily, um, because that stuff in the soil, the microbes will tie up some of it. Um, they will, because they'll utilize some of it as they're breaking down that carbon residue. But depending on how much you're going to be putting out there, uh, you know, when you start talking about organic matter, about a thousand pounds of organic in and a percent of organic matter. So if you're talking about putting it on amounts that are going to really make a difference, those are really high amounts, and I don't think the biology can handle that much at once. You'd have to kind of spoon feed it to them over time would be my answer to that. I mean, and I've seen people have a great response by spraying on a little nitrogen on corn stalks. I've also heard people say that doesn't work at all. And I'm guessing that probably has more to do with the moisture and temperature factor. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Kind of like flying on cereal rye. Sometimes it works great, other times it's a total bust. So, yeah, I wouldn't eliminate my high carbon stuff, but I would, you know, I would keep an eye on it. If I was growing, if I was growing corn and wheat, I wouldn't want to go into the cover crop that's 100% rye every year and let it grow really tall. I mean, you can still grow rye, but terminate a little earlier would be my option. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so the question was about nitrogen mineralization rates and, and based on precipitation, you know, areas of higher precipitation, lower, should we be changing that, that rate? Um, the answer is yes. If we end up in areas with, you know, areas that are getting 50, 60 inches of rain, their mineralization is going to be much different than what it would be on 15. Um, but one of the ways we get around that is that we don't look at basal respiration. So basal respiration is that in the field method where you're just using the conditions of the soil on a year long basis. Well, basal respiration is much higher in the southeast than it is in the north because of that factor you're talking about. He's calculating nitrogen mineralization based on the burst response. And the burst response has to do with significant drying and then re-wetting. And I don't remember the exact definition on how much rain that is, but it's, it's an actual breakdown per event. So it doesn't matter if you get 50 inches of rain a year or 20. At that point, necessarily, he's basing it strictly on the number of rainfall events that are over, I believe, an inch and a half or an inch per hour. And that would be what he considers significant. Now, they're breaking that down. What he's working on right now is changing some of that to be more regionally specific. So I said there's an average of four of those per year. But that is across the country. And you're going to get a lot more two-inch rains out east, but you've got to have the drying period between it. So if you get a two-inch rain and then two days later you get another two-inch rain, that doesn't count because you didn't have a drying period in between. So that's how they're doing it. They basically mine the, the weather data from uh, all over the country to come up with that number. But yeah, there's still work. He's working reg on regionalizing it a little more now. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Lance.